Point, which is, of course, a hoary old science fiction concept. What I try to do in World Wide Wine is to say, this is what a high wine can actually look like. This is what it could actually do. This is what it could actually feel like. So I try to go a bit beyond those Star Trek concepts, which simply take it for granted. They simply assume that it exists. And I say, well, here's how such a thing could happen. Here is what it could be like. So that is the arc of World Wide Wine. So I'm wrapping up. So, so thank you. So thank you for coming out. And thank you for listening. We have a little bit of time, a couple of minutes. We'll take one or two more questions, and then we'll take a break. Yes. Um, with your idea of how to transmit from mind to mind with the apple, is it, in your picture of it, is it the word apple that gets transmitted? So, or is it a picture, or is it the, or is it the feeling of being around an apple, <laughs> or is it is it to do with language? So, would, is that the way it's transmitted, or is it? I see it as being a non-linguistic thing. First, because we already have excellent technologies for transmitting text from one mind to another, the telephone, the internet. We don't need any help with that. Rather, I imagine firing the neurons in the brain that fire when you when you see an apple, should it give you that mental image of an apple? or very possibly your set of feelings about an apple so that you can eventually learn when this happens in my brain, that is telling me that someone else is actually experiencing an apple in some way or another. But people's experiences of the same object are often radically different, aren't they, to do with the like, subjective responses. So wouldn't that be a complication in trying to like tr uh, transfer information between strangers or Right, well, the question is, people's experiences are, are very different. And this is absolutely true. And this is something that I discuss at length in the book. So, <coughs> on the one hand, you do have these shared understandings. But we all know that when I pull this thing up, okay, we all know what it is. Even though our neural representations of it may be very different, we have an agreement that this is a piece of paper with PowerPoint presentation on it. So, in that sense, even though what your brain does, what my brain does, but nearly different, we still end up with the same agreement about what we're seeing. So I say that if I'm seeing an apple, my internal rig, my optogenetic rig, knows that and sends you that information. I compare it to storytelling. So when I tell a story of an event in my childhood, that does not tell you exactly how I experienced that event. What you do is you create a kind of simulacrum of that experience. And you may actually get much wrong. You may insert your own childhood home when I talk about one. If I talk about a childhood pet, you may insert your own childhood pet. So your ultimate neural internal picture is very different. But it is the same enough for you to feel that you understand what I am telling you. So I compare it to that kind of narrative storytelling experience. I do not say that would be a perfect method of communication. I do not say that it would allow us to eliminate language. In fact, I say that's never possible. We will never get beyond it. We will only find new ways of communicating with each other. But it would be a global language. It would be like a babel fish in your ear, right? It would be, there would be no, like I could have, I could be in conversation with French people and German people and. Well, yes, but not in a linguistic sense. No. So I talk about, for example, the fact that it, it raised the possibility of knowing the feelings of a group. So if, just to paint a wild scenario right now, say everybody in Japan was on this worldwide mind, the rest of us would be very aware there's a lot of shock, fear, unhappiness, anxiety going on, which is non-linguistic, but it is part of our shared universal human experience. In fact, Twitter kind of prefigured that experience. When I read my Twitter feed, and I was paying attention to what was going on in Libya, I was seeing these you know, really horrific tweets, you know, it's going, it made me feel like I was feeling what was going on in Libya, of course, through a linguistic <laughs> communication method, but still it was one that was empathetic and feeling-oriented rather than verbally-oriented. So yes, what you're saying is on the track of what I talk about in the book. Thank you. Any other questions or thoughts before we wrap up? Yes? I'm kind of curious. I'm imagining a scenario like you were talking about how with Twitter in Japan, you know, you felt like you were there. I'm just curious if other industries have looked into this too. For example, you have either the military looking into how this could be applied or even to like entertainment with movies. Like romantic comedies all of a sudden become, you actually feel it and you actually laugh. 
Um, so have other industries really looked into these yet? Or is it still kind of as a base stage where it's just been done? Well, a good deal of the research that I was talking about, you know, the monkey with prosthetic limbs, is funded by DARPA, the D Defense Advanced Research Project Agency. So they are certainly very interested about the possibilities of this kind of technology. Now, actual practical use of it are still very far off, but they certainly do imagine these kinds of uses. And I am not someone who's entirely in agreement with that kind of goal. I don't think such technology should be used to build, you know, better killers. But yeah, you know, technology is always a double-edged sword. Technology that will cook your meal can also burn down your home. So, but anyway, the dark is certainly thinking about this. You know, in that long-range theoretical kind of sense. I don't know about the entertainment industry, and that's still a long way off. But it's a very interesting story. Um, and some companies are starting to do what they call, um, what was it, semantic analysis? I forget the exact term that's in my book, but companies are trying to analyze Twitter things to get a sense of how consumers are feeling about yeah. their products, as opposed to what they're saying or what they're doing. It's a very different kind of analysis. And that's very tricky because the way people view language can be very ambiguous. And one person says, you know, that's killer, or that's bad, and that can actually mean it's good. So you have to be very careful when you do such analysis. But companies are starting to think about doing sentiment analysis, that's what it's called. So we are starting to see this kind of thing in a nascent form today. So, yes. so just, um, I don't know if you talk about this later or not, but the ethical dimension is being raised here uh, in my mind, and I'm sure in others. Um, has there been any center or discussion or uh, ongoing concern about this, the manipulation of people for other and many different kinds of reasons? This is the first concern that comes to mind in almost everybody when they think about this idea. The whole idea of Star Trek's war, right? This technology is used to enslave, to assimilate, to make people do things against their will. Um, Jack, when John Luke Picard is forcibly assimilating into the board, it's depicted as an emotional and physical rape. I mean, that is actually how he talks about it. So I do talk about this issue extensively in the book. I say that it does present these possibilities of manipulation and control. I contextualize them by saying, we have these problems now. In fact, Plato worried about these problems two and a half thousand years ago, where he argued that you can use text to manipulate people in ways that you couldn't necessarily do with face-to-face -face conversation. And I talk about the Pfizer's at some point. So I say that these are issues, but the quick point that I make is that, again, technology is a double-edged sword. That you get benefits, you also have to take the issues with it. And actually, you talk about, for example, a parallel with Facebook. So with Facebook, you have some control about who sees your profile, who gets to access information about you. And I say, we're just going to have to do the same thing with this kind of technology, where you get to control who has that access to your thoughts, and everybody else gets to control what kind of access you have to theirs. Now, that's a tricky analogy because Facebook has been <laughs> criticized precisely for jiggering around <laughs> with those privacy settings. But my point is that this is exactly the kind of discussion that we need to have. And it's the kind of discussion that we're having now, not just with hypothetical future technologies. OK, now I understand that we're going to have a, have a short break for a while, and we'll come back and have more discussion. So thank you all for coming. Welcome to stay after and have